I feel really privileged today um, to be here to talk to you all because you're all such an experienced audience. Often I'm um, speaking to people that are new to the dog world, um, but you've got a, a lot of experience behind you. Because no one here is uh, new to dog training and body language, what I thought is today is I'd, I'd touch on the dogs that I guess are going to give us the most grief in class. Um, I won't be looking so much at the happy regular dogs, but we'll be looking at the dogs that are under pressure. Um, sorry, I guess we'll get started. There we go. Okay, so uh, it's not news to anyone here um, that dogs have emotions. Um, I guess some of the emotions that are going to cause issues for us in class, um, things like fear. Fear is the way we feel when there is actually a real threat around, okay? Anxiety is another emotion that a lot of dogs in class might be feeling. It's a, a I guess, a, a response that prepares us for a threat that might become apparent. Um, so the difference would be if, oh, there's a little hole up there, if a spider dropped out of the ceiling oh, right now, oh, a great big huge one, that's fear, okay? It's big, it's real, it's here, that's fear. If I said to you, oh yeah, there was a whole heap of spiders that came out of that hole this morning before anyone got here, and I don't know where they all are, that's anxiety, okay? You don't know where they are. They could have all left, but they could be under your chair. And so that's the difference between fear and anxiety. I've got stress up there as well because some dogs come in, they're really excited. Um, and good stress is still stress, okay? Um, so the good stress, bad stress. And two different dogs will have a good stress or a bad stress in the same situation. It just depends on how they perceive it. And that comes down to the individual. Those three emotions, they have pretty much um, similar behavioural expressions, but changes in physiology. So the insides of the dogs are changing, and that's why we're seeing the behaviours. Okay, behaviour is more than just looking at, you know, a quick snapshot. Oh, that dog, you know, it's showing its teeth, or that dog is wagging its tail. It's more than just looking at a thing on the dog that it's doing at that time. Behaviour, it, it involves the posture of the dog, it involves the movement of the dog, the way um, that the dog is in, interacting with its environment and those around it, and what happens next? What is the function of that behaviour? Um, and that will help us understand maybe why that behaviour is happening as well. It is an insight into the internal thoughts and feelings of the dog, okay? And I always put that at the bottom there, just how much we should think about before we start using corrections in training. Um, we need to look closely at the behaviours that are there. Okay. Um, so Lee actually touched on this as well. As she said, you know, some of the dogs you're getting, they'll have a genetic predisposition to behave a certain way. And that's a, genetics is one of the big three things that influence our behaviour and our dog's behaviour as well, is how we're genetically geared up. Um, the environment that we're in will influence our behaviour as well. And Lee touched on the learning as well. So some of the, these dogs you'll be seeing have had an unknown or maybe a less than ideal upbringing during that critical period. It might not even be as deep as that. It's just, you know, previous months at dog school, this happened. And I have learnt that it's not safe, it's not fun, or I run around and I'm a lunatic and I get off lead and that is fun. And, you know, those things that they've learnt is what they're bringing with them on that day. Okay. Um, now, I've given you all brain warmers. Okay. I don't really expect anyone to really, you know tick off everything that they think. But the idea behind the brain warmer is to be thinking. Um, that first one, the wagging tail, the pet owners are gonna be coming into classes and they're gonna be thinking, oh, wagging tail, happy dog. There's a couple more options under that and I think pretty much everyone in here is gonna go, oh yeah, and that, oh yeah, and that. And I had some people in the break go, is there more than one answer? I was like, yeah, yeah, there's more than one answer. So this is a happy wag, and you can see it's happy because it's floppy, okay? It's curling all the way round to his hip. It's a big, wide, floppy wag. That's a happy wag, okay? There's a lot about that dog that looks like he's happy, all right? Happy dog. <coughs> um, this dog's wagging his tail as well. This was taken on the same day as the other dog. 
Um, do you reckon this dog's feeling the same way? No. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, his ears are back, doesn't look really comfortable, does he? He looks kind of unsure. Yeah. The wag in that tail, his tail's actually tucked close to his bottom, and it's the lower half that's doing the wag. And it looks like a floppy wag, the bit that's wagging, but the tail's tucked down, okay? So it's not a comfortable wag, all right? And so wagging tails is one thing, you know, you can look at, but you can break it down. Then you look at the whole dog. Then you look at the environment the dog's in. This dog's doing a public display, okay? So, you know, there's, there's lots going on there. Ooh. Teeth, all right. <laughs> Sorry, mum, this is mum's dog. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, if you just look at that dog's teeth, you'd go, whoa, that dog's got its mouth open, there's lots of teeth, it's aggression. Let's look at the picture. All right, let's look at the environment that the dog's in. Look at the dogs around it. Does she look worried? No. She's not worried. Play, it's always people, new people always go, how do you tell if your dog's playing? <laughs> they look ridiculous. They look ridiculous. Everything's exaggerated. I mean, look at that. He's S-shaped. It's just... So this is play, okay? But you've got to look at more than just the one thing, yeah? Okay, what about this dog? This dog's showing teeth. Yeah, I don't have any more to show on this picture. This is, this is all I've got of this picture. This is taken by a client. Um, yeah, so I think everyone's picking up that's maybe not play. Yeah. This is fear, okay? So we can see the whites of the eyes, the teeth are being shown, his ears are pinned back. He's making himself small. Do you see that? He's down low. So frightened dogs often go low, they go round. They're rounded shapes. You can't see the rest of his body, but I can bet that he doesn't have his back legs stretched out. I'm sure they're all tucked in, making himself round. Another dog with teeth. Um, this is one I pulled off the internet. Thank heavens I haven't met the dog in this mood. <laughs> and certainly I wouldn't be taking photos if I did. Um, so play, no fear. Yeah, it could be barking. Looks angry. Looks angry. So what about it makes it look angry? The eyes. So it's staring, but it's got the it's little furrows in its eyebrows. You can see its eyebrow furrows. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Now I've got another one that's pretty similar, and again, off the internet, it's a wolf. So same sort of setup. You've got its face, it's looking square on, it's got its mouth open, it's showing its teeth less intense yeah you can see that so his eyebrows his eyes are soft if you just look at his eyes he's still got his thinking brain on he's thinking okay this guy not so calm yeah so aggression is a communication tool by dogs okay and this guy's using it really well he says no dude i'm not okay with this sort yourselves out you know, and it's a calm warning. It's a visual display. I don't think this dog, this wolf has got intention of going in there as long as they sort themselves out. So keep that in mind too. Even when you're seeing teeth and it's an aggressive display, what's the intention of the behavior? What happens next? Yeah? Is your question? With the eyes and the rock wheel, yeah. is that an automatic response of a dog that's going to an aggression if the eyes do go tight? Or is it just something that they can control? Yeah, so the question was um, how much of the facial expression can the dog voluntarily control? I think that um, things like pupil size and shapes of the eye is, is involuntary. It would be like us when we get really angry. You know, we can certainly put it on, but when we're in the moment, it's involuntary. And the same with this dog. This dog doesn't know it's doing this with its face. And the same, the wolf doesn't know it's doing that with its face. Um, so these would be involuntary things that we can use as information about their emotional state. Yep. Okay, and then there's these guys, which <laughs> we see these sometimes. Yeah, so. Okay, hackles up. Apologies for this photo. I took this the other day, walking down the street with my kids. <laughs> Yay. Um, so this dog's off lead. It's started coming at us. It was barking at us. Its hackles are up. Its tail is still. 
and it was coming straight at us. Um, we did the hole and it just stopped and it stood there and that's when I looked up my camera and went, do you want a behaviour talk, take a photo? And it eventually retreated back to the car is where it was actually coming from. I think we can pick up the body language of this dog is a little bit hostile. <laughs> He's not exactly friendly. Um, you've got ears forward, hackles up. Okay, the next pictures are off the internet so you can see the hackles a little bit easier. So the hackles, the fur on the back of the neck, you can see this guy because the collar pushes the fur down. He's really hackled up. He's standing still, his tail is up. I think maybe a little bit feathery as well. How's this guy feeling? He's not, he's not the same as that guy. No, he's anxious. He's curious, yeah? So I can give you some more story about this guy. This guy is meeting sheep for the first time. Okay, so he doesn't quite know what those fluffy things are over there. But he's interested, he thinks he likes them, but he's unsure. Hackles go up, okay. And then this guy. So similar sort of deal, he's got the neck, the shoulders, and then the rump hackles are up. How's he feeling? Cautious, uncertain, a little less confident than our black friend. Yeah, so hackles is another one that's commonly misinterpreted. Oh, his hackles are up, he's aggressive. These dogs aren't aggressive. They're uncertain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this guy's not sure. Yeah, the energy in his stance is backwards. So you feel if he was going to move, if we had the next frame, he would be moving backwards, wouldn't he? Yeah, whereas the black dog, the energy is forward direction, yeah. So again, you, you kind of get a feel, the muscle tension, the energy, what's going to happen next? What's the function of the behaviour? Why do we think the hackles are up? Is it aggression? No. So just a question, you're saying the hackles raise is a sign of arousal more than either aggression or anything. So it's a sign the dog's aroused emotionally. Yes, so hackles are, they come up with arousal, yep. And I find the hackles over the rump seem to come up more when they're a little bit un, um, like fearful of a situation, if there's like that, I, I might be at risk, yeah? Um, okay, so our next dog. Ears down. So a bit blurry because this little lass wasn't sitting still and I'm trying to take a picture of her lovely body language. Um, I think this is really obvious how this dog's feeling. Yeah. So she's at the vet clinic. Yeah. So ears are right back, like you can't even see if she has ears, they are right back down. Big dilated pupils, wide open mouth and the tongue, I'm not sure if you can really see but it's spoon shaped. You see it's wider at the tip and narrower down the, the body of the tongue, yep. And she's, she's quite hunched sitting there on the knee, she's leaning into the owner, she's making herself round and trying to avoid. So we've got ears down with fear. Okay. Um, this guy's got his ears down. How's he feeling? Is this fear? <laughs> he's curious, yeah. So he's gone, he's put himself in this situation. He's actually got the lamb cornered. And he's gone, oh, I don't really know what to do now. <laughs> Oops, socially awkward situation, yeah. So we've got our ears down because he's uncertain. He's not feeling overly confident. His tail is up and out. He's not making himself round, he's still moving forwards. So no, it's not fear. I'm going to draw attention to the tongue flick because I don't have many others in the picture. I did a heavy cull on pictures. Tongue flicks, we're going to look at oral behaviours later. But he's got a tongue flick happening. So he's put himself under pressure. He's done it to himself. He's gone, oh, there's a little lamb, I'm going to go investigate. Oh, I should be doing something different, I don't really know. You know, it's a bit socially awkward. <laughs> But ears down, okay? Uh, all right, same dog again, sorry guys. Um, with a whippet, they've both got their ears down. Is this fear? Is this social awkwardness? What is it? Play. Yep. And again, we can tell it's play because the collie in particular looks a bit ridiculous. He's almost off balance. You know, the whippet's ready to run. Um, and so this is, this is play. So ears can go down with, with play. Yeah, he is. He's half bowing, yeah. Is that a little bit of 
submissiveness as well as I'm just playing and not being aggressive? Is this polite? inflictions in play so they constantly check in with each other and so yeah the ears will be moving sometimes they might be right up forward when the the confidence in the play increases and then they come back um, the whippet here is just a pup I think only four four and a half months old and the other bloke is an adult entire male so you know easily intimidating for the puppy so he's being very polite you know I'm just gonna play very gently and put my ears back as they got to know each other the ears came up and play got rough um, okay so here's a dog with its ears down is it playing no um, how's this dog feeling Not happy. Uncomfortable? Yeah. Anxious, yeah. Yep. So again, you see the shape of the tongue. It's wider at the tip than it, through, the, through the body of the tongue. Yep. Um, he's looking a little un unsure. He's under pressure. He's um, doing a demo. Now, this dog um, is going to appear over the next couple of photos. I've got a few of him or her. I'm not sure who it is. Um, working again under pressure in a demo okay um, I think the the organization that the training that they'd done beforehand was in a much bigger space than they were assigned and so the the owners were confused as to the direction they were going as well and the dog's disengaged he's not working with the handler so you can see he's not really overly comfortable but then the owner does an about turn and tries to re-engage with the dog, takes the dog by the collar and says, come on, I've got you, you know, work with me here, connect with me here, we've got this together. Check out the dog's mouth. So the first picture we saw, it was kind of open, he was kind of looking around, he's closed it and his lips have gone short. So they've gone from, from up under his eyes, they've gone short towards his nose, okay. His tail's down, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how's he feeling? He's under pressure. He's under pressure. Okay. So next picture of that dog, okay, is now sitting. Now, this dog's not sleepy. He's in the middle of an obedience demo in public. Stress yawn, oral behaviours, yawning, okay? And people go, yeah, but sometimes dogs just yawn. Yeah, but they don't just yawn for that amount of time, you know? His eyes are closed, he's turning away from his handler. It's a big stress yawn, okay? And the other thing I want to slot in here is that nose lick that they do, the tongue flick that we saw in the collie earlier. That's an oral behaviour that can indicate that the pressure's escalating. <coughs> now, these things don't mean that the dog is suffering. They don't mean that the dog is struggling, but it does mean that the dog is feeling the pressure. So it's time to reassess what the dog's going through okay so with these guys what can we do to make the dog feel more comfortable how can we help the dog succeed the dog's trying to disengage with the handler it wasn't healing before it's not healing now taking it by the collar it still doesn't really want to look at its owner what can we do to help make this demo more successful to make this dog work better you know and these are the the questions that you're going to have during your classes the dog's disconnecting i'm seeing oral behaviors it's yawning it's licking its lips you know, we need to do something before it becomes an unpleasant experience for the dog because then it's going to learn that class is not fun. And then it's going to be harder for you to work with. Okay. All right, so troubleshooting dogs. Um, you get into a club um, and you look at the class and you see there's some dogs in there and they're not really paying attention to the owner. Okay. They're um, sniffing, they're pulling, um, even if the lead's given a, a, a pull, um, even if the owner's saying, hey, hey, look at me, look at me, the dog's like, no. There's some might be just lunging and barking and the owner's, you know, wrangling like this. You might go, off lead time, we'll unhook the lead. Okay, everybody, are you ready? And the dog's gone. <laughs> um, that happens. All right, I'll pull out my treats, I'll try and feed it. And then suddenly it turns into a piranha fish and there's, you know, almost bloodshed as the dog's snatching the treats out of the owner's hand. This is what the owner's seeing. The owner's feeling embarrassed, the owner's feeling stressed, the owner thinks their dog is being bad. You guys look closer and what you actually see is these dogs are tense. They're on the muscle, okay? They're making hard, sharp, fast <coughs> movements, okay? The dog's tail is wagging but it's not that floppy wag. It's not a relaxed wag, okay? What does a wagging tail mean? 
a desire to interact. You look at the rest of the dog to work out the nature of that interaction. Okay. Um, the dog's got some hackles up, it's panting, its mouth is wide, you're seeing some yawns, it's got wrinkles over its eyebrows. And when the dog is sniffing, he's actually got his nose down and then he flicks his eyes around. So you see the whites of his eyes showing. And when he snatches the treats, you see the same sort of thing. The whites of his eyes flash again. So you're seeing more than what the owner sees. It's the same dog, but you will pick up on more than the owner. And so you're going to need to counsel the owner, look, your dog's under pressure, okay? And you can maybe inform the owner what you're seeing, how it differs to what they're seeing. It's not a bad dog, it's a dog under pressure, okay? So the unruly behaviour has an underlying emotional cause. The dog's not being bad, he's stressed. Some stress might be fear, some might be anxiety, some might be that just ridiculous level of excitement, okay? A lot of dogs have all three. Some might even have more. It's a tangle of emotions when they get to dog club. It's just like crazy, okay? There's a lot going on um, and the owners are there to teach their dog and suddenly their dog's changed. It's not the dog that I have at home, it's this and it's been bad and everyone's looking at me, you know. So the owner needs to know that the way their behaviour is will influence the way the dog will behave. So if they can remain calm, give the dog space, maybe feed it, put it in a better emotional state, the dog's behaviour will change, okay. And that's something that we, you guys have probably heard it too. Oh, you can't feed him, he's being bad. Don't feed him. It's like, well, he's not being bad, he's in a bad emotional place. So you take him out, you give him the food, fix his emotions, his behaviour will get better and then he can learn. Yeah? Okay, so yeah, so that's your job. Talk to the owner. Um, and what would punishment do? In a dog that's jumping and barking and showing the whites of its eyes and sniffing and disconnecting, if you give it an almighty correction, how's that going to make the dog feel? Yeah. It might make the behaviour look better he would stop lunging on the lead if you gave him a decent enough correction, for sure. It's not going to make him feel better. And he's still going to have that disconnect. Okay. So, um, so I've got a couple of photos now. This is a series of three, and I'm just going to flick through them like this. And then I'm going to flick back. There's a bit of a story going on with these three. What are we seeing? Shall we start with the first dog, the dog with the green ribbon? How's he feeling? So we go through the three photos. <laughs> so we all see he doesn't move. Is he looking away? Is he looking at the other dogs? Is his tail wagging? No. So this dog has no desire to interact. He's not particularly feeling under pressure. He's not looking away. He's not sniffing. He's got a soft pant and his eyes are closed for the whole three pictures. He is picking up on what the other two are doing and he's being the calming force. Now let's look at the other two. So the dog in the middle with the red ribbon, what's he doing? Yeah, I like this. I think this picture sums up the middle dog the best. He's obviously been left on a standstay. He sits. When a dog sits, it's to calm the situation, okay? Sit is less confrontational than a stand. A down is less confrontational again. He decides to sit. He's under pressure. He's had a sit. His ears are back. And in one of them, is he the one that does the lip lick? No. No, the other one does. Yeah. So he's under pressure. He's uncomfortable. I, don't, I think if he could look away, he would, but he's got a dog either side of him. <laughs> so he can't really look anywhere, okay? And then the dog on the end, okay, we've got a look away, we've got a lip lick, yeah, yeah, we've got our ears are back, and there's another lick. So what's going on with those two dogs? What's their issue? Yeah, they don't want to be there. They're politely telling each other, I'm really sorry I'm in your space, I'd much rather have more space between us than what our owners have given us. 
okay? But sometimes owners do crazy things, like when the father, son and nephew, all of the same breeding lines win first, second and third obedience at the Royal, you want a picture of the family? <laughs> They're three entire males that never met each other. What a crazy idea. So no, they weren't comfortable, but we got our pictures and they, none of them are smiling, so. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so under pressure. Okay, this dog um, doing his demo, he's disconnected from his owner, okay? His tail is down, his ears have gone sideways, he's kind of gazing off, okay? Um, we'll be working with dogs that'll do this. We might see them do it in the ring, like during training. There's two ways to really handle it. You go, oi, get in the heel. Or you go, hey, what's going on? This owner went, hey, what's going on? You're okay, can you manage? And look at the response she gets. Instant connection, there's our floppy tail wag. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, now the next couple of pictures I've got are, um, I think there's about 14 all in a row. It was before I had a video camera, so it's meant to be a video. I'll just flick through them. Who wants to sum up that dog? Oh. Under pressure. It's the answer of the day. Under pressure. So the dog's there to meet the public. Okay. It's obviously a really nice dog because he's put up with a lot. I don't know how long he's already been meeting the public for. He might. It might be his third day in a row. I don't really know. Um, but here, is he looking at the people? No. Is his tail moving? Is it wagging? No. Okay, yeah, head's down. Okay. He's kind of looking a bit, you know, whatever. He's getting a pat there and he's not really acknowledging it. He's kind of ignoring it. We've got a blink here and I hear often, oh yeah, so what, you've just taken a camera, you know, taken a photo when the dog's blinking. I was like, well, see how many pictures I get of this dog blinking and see how many pictures you have at home of your dog blinking. These are slow blinks. They're calming blinks. Okay. Oh, he's kind of half blinking there. Okay. There's another one. Another one. He's sniffing. Okay. What were we saying before about lying down? Yeah, I mean he might just be tired too, he's a really big dog, he could just be tired. But you look at the behaviours before, the behaviours that follow and the situation that he's in. So anyway, then we reach through the fence to pat him because, you know, the dog's still there so he still needs to be pat. Now the dog's starting to look miserable, his mouth has gone short, his eyebrows have started to furrow, you can see his eyes have changed shape. His ears go back. Now we get the yawn. And then there's just that face, look at that face, okay. So, he's a good dog, does he probably need a break? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not, not commenting on the owners, but I, I, what I'd like to think is the owners then gone, oh, righty, okay, well, we've been here for, you know, 20 minutes, you've had pats from 50 people, it's time to, time to go out now. Okay. Um, and I've got some videos. I think I can get to work. This one is super quick, okay? I'll give you a rundown. So um, the German Shepherd and the Border Collie don't know each other, okay, but they are at club. Oh, okay, that was quick, that was quick. There we go. <laughs> What's the commentary on that interaction? <laughs> So is the German Shepherd under pressure? No. no. Is the Border Collie under pressure? Yes. Little pressure? Yeah. No. Big pressure? I think little pressure. I think the Shepherd's being polite enough. But the Shepherd's there, oh hi, hi, nice to meet you. I'm going to sniff your ears and sniff your shoulder and the Border Collie's looking away. We've got a lean away, we've got a yawn. The Shepherd goes, oh, you want me over here? And then the Collie's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and um, he's come back to his owner there. So there's little things like that happen all the time at club. 
And I'm lucky to have this video actually because it just shows, you know, like they're just people talking with friendly dogs, calm, relaxed, friendly dogs. And we're just chatting. But this is what's happening behind our backs. Our dogs are interacting and our dogs are talking. And are our dogs having a good time? You know. But it's the humans that talk and don't what their dogs are doing. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, we don't know. Okay, all right. Another video. This one's a bit longer. Um, so this is a second-hand Kelpie. That's great. Okay. So what sort of behaviours did we see? Because we, we get an overall feel. We can see, you know, we get the feel, oh, the dog doesn't really know what it wants, you know. It's kind of, you know. But what behaviours are we seeing the dog do? We see a play bow. Now, if I pause it. I can't pause it on the play bow. Let's try again. Okay, so there's our, there's our play bow. Where's our tail? Are we round? We're a little bit round. So play bow, yes. Is it play? <coughs> Maybe. Could it be a displacement behaviour? Could we be fiddling? Are we anxious? If that cat got off the bed to play with the dog, where would the dog go? <laughs> And we can tell that because the, the way the dog is moving, the, the feel, when you look at the dog, you know it's going to go backwards. So, I, you know, I'm not entirely convinced this is normal play. The tail wagging down low, do you see that? Yeah. Checking in with the, the owner that's there, okay. His ears are up, his hackles are up, so, you know, he's alert. He's certainly curious. He keeps checking in. We end up with barks at some point too. But that head down, duck away sort of business. A little bit of fear. Yeah. Well, I think he's looking for the owner for, for information. How is the owner responding to this cat on the bed? What's the owner doing? And the owner's remaining impartial. I'm not giving you any feedback. There's no information from me. Sort it out yourself. Okay, and the dog's not sure what to do, all right. Um, and so dog under pressure. So not all play bows are going to be in play. Mostly, sometimes they're stretching, but sometimes you get these funny little things that are, when dogs aren't comfortable, they resort to these fiddle behaviours. And we're talking about the rollovers before. Some dogs will roll on their back and you go, oh, look, normally she doesn't like to meet new people, give her a belly rub. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, she bites. The rolling over is displacement behaviour. I'm not comfortable, I don't know what to do, I'm under pressure, I'm going to do this. So look at the behaviours leading up, look at the environment, know how the dog would typically react and say, hang on a second, that rolling over, that could be a trap. This play bow, that could be a trap. Is the dog really playing? Have a look at the movement. Do you think the dog wants to play? Maybe one day, but not then. Okay. So it's, it's interesting, it's all very tricky. Oh, hang on, there we, there we go, okay. All right, so back to the collies again. <laughs> um, so I'll give you a rundown. The dog on the floor is a bit sensitive, okay. The dog standing up is a bit rough, okay. They do sometimes play, but she is going to ask him to play. And I want you to have a look at him. Mm -hmm. 
So there's not a lot of play happening there. And there's a yawn from the back of her head, if you could see it. Yeah. Okay. So watch it again. And um, some of you might have picked up on this, but watch the pupils in the black dog. She's standing over him. He's leaning back, pinning his ears. His pupils are dilated. She sits down. Instantly, they get smaller. She lays down. They get smaller again. And that's involuntary. But it's a clue to his emotional state. So when she's come barreling in and stood over him and said, let's play, he's gone, whoa, you know, didn't really want to get involved in that, you know. She's laid, so she sat, she's lay, she's yawned, she's calmed. He's responded by feeling better. He still doesn't play with her. <laughs> okay. Do anyone want to say that again? Yeah? Watch it again. So that's a desire to interact, wagging tail, floppy wag, yeah? And then even her ears relax there. Do you see that? Yeah, she's different. She knows she's not going to get to play with him. Okay, so this is the same little black dog with the dog he lives with who knows that he's a bit of a softie. So the other dog knows how to get him to play. So you can see he's approached differently. He's approached from the down. Then he plays a bit of hard to get. Soft waggy tail, floppy waggy tail, invitation to join him in the toy bed. Okay? Their dogs are talking. Yeah? So we start off with a bit of gentle bitey face and, you know, and go from there. Now this play gets quite rough and they both kind of come to the conclusion that the game needs to end. And you watch how it, how it pans out once they have a bit of a wrestle. Yeah, it goes on a bit, but you know, dogs. So play, they take it in turns in being on top. Okay, the bigger one's on top a lot too, but the little one gets on top too. So, you know, it's play. <laughs> but it got a bit rough. Did you both see, see the wet dog shake? And then they kind of look at each other and go, oh, I should have videoed them the next couple of seconds, but he left the room and the other one went the other way. Um, and so they, they start off really gentle, Introduction to play, here's the toys, bitey face, big wrestle, I hump you, you hump me. Oh, actually, that's a bit awkward. Shake it off. Play ends. There's a lot going on in that clip. Okay. They're, um, they're quite complicated. So it's a lot to take on. And when, I don't envy instructors. <laughs> You're in there with people that don't know what they're doing, with dogs that don't know what they're doing, in a group. And you've got to like see what the dogs are doing, see what the owners are doing, and then try and act as a translator and still get the best out of the dog. It's a big job. Um, so you know, I hope you've picked up a few things from today that might make it a bit easier. Here's my dog under pressure. He's got to rescue the baby from falling down a well. I thought, oh yeah, under pressure. <laughs> um, but take home messages. Um, dogs, behavior, dogs behaving are often dogs that are talking. They're not always. Sometimes dogs really do just have an itch. You know, <laughs> sometimes they really do just want to smell that smell. So it's not, it doesn't always mean something. But a lot of the times when you've got those dogs misbehaving in class, there's going to be a reason for it. Okay. Um, changing our behaviour will take the pressure off the dog and they will change their behaviour. Okay. Dogs that feel safe and calm will learn better and that makes your job easier. And so even if, like what Lee was saying, you, you break off and you have a sniff and then you come back, if you need to do that with all the dogs in the class or just one of the dogs in the class and come back, if that's what it takes to keep the dogs calm, they're going to learn better. Um, and so, you know, I just hope you can pick up on a few of those things we've talked about today.
any any questions? Are there any questions for Carrie? So the question is, are there some socially inept dogs? <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> um, and they can learn basic manners. So that three second meet and greet thing that Lee was demonstrating, you can teach a socially inept dog how to approach another dog calmly and then retreat on cue. So you can take away that ridiculous, you know, I have to get in your face to love you because I, you know, you can teach them appropriate responses. Um, it, you might have to work a bit harder to, if you had a dog that was appropriately socialised and knew about reading other dogs' social cues and things like this. You may have to be that dog's translator. I've seen that happen a few times where you go, no, no, that other dog, he says no. You want to come with me? He says no. <laughs> you know, and they don't always pick up on that. Yeah, yeah. I don't mean to pick on any particular but I'm finding that Labrador is very charming in that regard. They're just barrelling up with friends with everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the time that it pays off for them because they're Labradors and they're cute and everyone kind of goes, oh, it's just a friendly Labrador. They get away with it some of the time and it works out and that's reinforcing to them. So we need to say to the owners, the way your dog greets other dogs is rude. He's going to get himself in trouble. You need to make sure that it never happens. You stop him greeting dogs unless he greets dogs according to the social rules that we think is appropriate at club. You know, and so we've got to kind of come down hard to, for the consistency. We've got to get be consistent for the dogs to learn. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, if one dog wants to end play and then the other dog can't and continues to play, do we have to intervene? Yeah, I think it's useful to do that. Um, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, just put yourself in your dog's shoes. It's like, no, I'm trying to do some work. And then there's that person beside you talking and you're like, I'm trying to do something, you know, and they're talking and then the boss works, walks in and you're like, oh, quick, everyone do some work. You know? So you might only have to stand there and be a presence and go, hey, he said no. You know, and that's something that we do often with puppies as well, like while they're learning and then the adult dog says no and they've done the polite, I've said no, without making the adult dog completely, you know, go nuts. You can say, hey, dude, do you want a distraction? Because that dog said no. And the puppy will start to learn when that dog does this, I do something else, you know. And so you can definitely um, step in, yeah, for sure. That's a good, that's a good example. And a puppy, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, sorry, Del, does it come down to the, the puppies have been taken away from the, the mother earlier? Like at, at eight weeks old, have they learned the, the social behaviour of, of dog on dog? It makes a big difference if, yeah, there's, so if they've got a litter, like Singleton. Sorry, the question was um, how likely is an early separation from the litter going to result in these sorts of inept behaviours? Yeah. It plays a big role. Genetics? And learning also play a role in behaviour. And so some dogs, perhaps the strain of Labradors that is around where you are, maybe there's a genetic component that they're very confident and friendly dogs, so they go barrelling up without asking many questions. Um, and so the genetics will play a role as well as um, the socialising and, and the learning components that they've been exposed to. So large litters, you know, it's always a problem when you've got a singleton litter or when you've got a litter of three because then two you get on one and, you know, you've yeah. got to manage. So, yeah, it's hard work being a good breeder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. Uh, just, does a, a German Shepherd, do they have the same signals as a Rottweiler and as, as does a, a Labrador? Ah, good question. Yep. So do different breeds have um, different communication skills? Yeah. Um, no, however, they do have different abilities. I find pugs very challenging to hear. <laughs> um, they don't move their faces as well as, as other breeds. Um, they got the ears, um, but the, the noses and, and even the eyes um, are, are different. Um, just the way that, way that they shape. Um, poodles, trying to see hackling in a poodle. And, and the, the doodle breeds, hard, hard to see these things. Um, 
but they, they still all use the same, you know, and you see like the dogs that have the bobbed tails will wiggle their bottom more than a dog that has an actual tail. So a lot of the times they learn what their handicaps are and can, you know, manage differently. Yeah. Um, dogs are pretty forgiving as we know, you know, like we can look however we want to look and they, they seem to know that we're still people, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, you can dress up or, or you, wheelchair or walking frame. They still know that we're people, even though we move differently and walk differently. And so they still will know that it's a dog that will speak dog, even though it might have different characteristics and, and different abilities, I guess. Yeah. Ooh, lots of questions. Yes. If you've got um, what do you think is a fairly aggressive dog standing over, literally over the top of, of another dog, um, and the owner is at some distance. What's the best way of, um, of separating them if the, if the more submissive dog is sort of basically on the ground? What can, you, what can you do in that sort of circumstance? That's a really tough question and it would vary depending on the education of the dogs, <laughs> the intention of the interaction, um, as well as the environment it's in. Because if there's going to be other dogs fly in, then you're going to need to move quick. If the dogs have got a really good recall, I would recall the dog on top. If they don't have a recall, if they don't have a recall you're going to have to just play it by feel. Um, that's a hard one. Um, ideally, you try and prevent those sorts of scenarios happening. You would see the body language building up to that. The play is not even. One dog is always after the other dog. It doesn't turn and things like this. So you'd look at preventing it. Once it's happened, I, I don't know if there's anything I can say that would be safe in every situation. So I probably can't give advice on what you would do then. But if you look at the intention of the interaction, so if the dog underneath has you know, just been ridiculous and the dog on top is giving it maybe a, maybe a deserved correction, um, you would let, wait for it to diffuse and they would diffuse themselves. But if the dogs that don't know each other and there's an issue and one dog has just pinned another, yeah, I, I, I think if there was one way to fix that, we'd probably all know it. Um, yeah, yeah, these quick movements can cause quick movements and slow movements can not be quick enough. And yeah, recall would be your best bet. Dogs shouldn't be off lead unless they've got a recall. In that yeah. situation, I sort of wonder that a human interaction might actually make it worse. Yeah, a lot of the time, if it's just dogs sorting things through, letting it diffuse you know, is an option, but it, it depends. It depends on so many variables, yeah. Um, yes? I have a question. <laughs> what do you, um, in your opinion, what are some of the most important things for club instructors to impart or to tell other the, their people who are coming in with their dogs about dog-to-dog -dog interaction? So if you were instructing at a club and you had people coming in maybe for the first or second time with their puppies or their dogs, what do you think it's important to, for the instructors to tell them about dog-to-dog -dog interaction? Yeah, so when I start taking my puppy classes, um, the first thing I talk about is body language and round dogs are scared, dogs moving away are scared, okay? And so you need to watch your own dog. If they go round, if they move away, then they're feeling scared and it's your job to remove the pressure, remove them from the situation, give them some food. They also need to watch the other dog that their dog's interacting with. Is the other dog going round? Is it looking scared? Is it moving away? Is it getting snappy? Because if it is, that's still your responsibility to move your dog away. And so that's probably the real basic puppy 101 thing. Look at what your dog is feeling. Look at what the other dog is feeling. And if it's anything but fun and play, move away and give them food. Yeah, and that's pretty basic stuff, yeah. Yes? What would you suggest to a person whose dog is fairly aggressive that they should take them off to see a vet about getting them some medication to calm down? That's a really great question. So the question was, um, how do we know when the problem behaviour such as aggression is beyond the abilities of a trainer, when do they need um, medical help, veterinary help? Um, if the problem seems like it's, you, you could reason that, oh yes, that dog is being aggressive because the other dog eyeballed it, or that dog is being aggressive because it's excited, and you move it away and it self-settles, you remove away the target, the aggression, and it self-settles, 
then it's you're going to be looking at maybe we can manage it, maybe we can do training stuff. If the aggression is unpredictable, unprovoked or abnormal, maybe a high intensity directed towards people, I'd be looking at referral then. So um, we will say if there's a problem behaviour, so um, barking, jumping, pulling, it's a normal behaviour that's a problem for people, you guys can deal with it. If it's a behaviour problem, so it's a behaviour that's abnormal, abnormal intensity, abnormal frequency, or it just doesn't make sense in any context, then that's going to be a medical issue. And that's when you start maybe utilising your vets a little bit. Um, and often there's overlap, like vets don't just prescribe medication, they, they do modification and engage trainers as well. But I think if you look at the dog and go, is this behaviour normal or abnormal, then you'll have your answer. If you think it's abnormal, refer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? What does mounting mean? Mounting? Yeah, like those two dogs do in terms of... Oh, mounting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So what does it mean when they, when they mount? Um, yeah, look, it's, it's an, you know, dogs come with these pre-programmed behaviour sequences. It's pre-programmed. It's, I guess, basis is for reproduction. Is it just for that? No. Um, they pull out their pre-programmed behaviour sequences in play, as we saw. Um, and sometimes it can be self-calming, um, self-soothing, or it can be a displacement behaviour as well. If they're feeling under pressure and they have their item that they like to hump, that's that thing. If you try and take it off them and it's a displacement behaviour, you may elicit an aggressive response, you know. But if it's play and you take it off them, you'll get a play. You know, like, it, it, it varies in what it means. Um, historically, people have used it as a um, way to identify a dominant dog and I, I don't really think that that's... I think it's more complex, more fluid than just putting it in a box, that dog is dominant. Um, a lot of dogs will have them and the dogs that practice them and like them will do them more often. And so that's why some dogs do it a lot. Other dogs don't do it very much. Yep. Calm themselves down. Yep. 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 <laughs> yes. I think, yeah, just spending time with them and you'll pick up on the subtle, subtle things if you're looking for it. I think that dogs that are, I, I guess, restricted in one area don't necessarily overcompensate in other areas. Some may, but it'll be individual, yeah. Yeah. Is that everything? Sorry, can I just ask, for the breed of dogs that have got perky ears, right, yep. so they're always up, and I've been sitting here trying to think, because I have one of those breeds, do they flatten? Yes. Oh, they do. All right, yes. I'm sitting here thinking, I've never, I can't remember yep. Jasper being stressed and his ears going flat. They're always... Straight up, yeah. yeah. I mean, we saw the shepherds have a whole, like the shepherds in the slides were very expressive in their ears today. Yeah. Um, Kelpies, was yours a Kelpie? Mine, no, yeah. mine's in the Western Malamu. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But uh, the, the Kelpies, I find you're working Kelpies, their ears are up all the time because they're always information gathering. They're always, always going, always going, always going. But you notice when they're coming in and, you know, they're, they're excited to see the owner, they go right back. So but, the, yeah, the, you the very rarely... go flat against their head, not... Yeah. Yeah, they go flat against there. They they kind of they turn. Yeah. Play, play, play. Oh uh, yes. That's handler psychology. Ooh. <laughs> um, I would put it back to them. Um, 
how, how do you think your dog is going? Because if their dog is upsetting the rest of the class, their dog is obviously not learning quietly. So I would bring it back to them. How do you feel today is going for your dog? Do you feel your dog is getting things that it needs to get out of this class today? Because I feel perhaps your dog might do better if we did it this way. What do you think about that? Let's try it for this next section and then we can come back and reevaluate. So I might um, look at it that way. And owners, they don't really care what anyone else's dogs are doing. They just want their own dog to be awesome. And so bring it back to them. You know, how, how, is your dog awesome today? Because I think we could do better. And I think you'd, you'd motivate most people that way. Yeah. Yes. trying to, like, you know, you say take the dog out of class, they do, they walk the dog around a bit, they come back, the dog starts to react, they go and correct and yanks them again. Trying to get through to that person that you're not actually helping, you're making it worse, it becomes a real problem because the dog escalates, the owner escalates, and it goes on. Send them to Lee. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, it's hard because that is, um, it's, I mean, a positive training is a lifestyle. It's not, you don't just live at home and then you go and do positive training. It's how you interact with your dog at home. It's a whole lifestyle. So you get them for, what, an hour and an over once a week if they come every week. And then they go home. And that dog has to live with them at home. So you, you can't change the way they are at home in a session. You can do your best. If they're keen on improving, you can just chip away little by little. But it is, it's a lifestyle. Um, and you just, sometimes you you're going to really struggle, um, and that's when I defer to trainers. This one's probably not going to consist, they just want the dog to sit in the home. Yeah. And you're not going to get any more Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. But they're coming to a trainer, so there is hope. <coughs> <sighs> yep, so that's time. One more? Last one? I guess um, they, they look for a lot of reasons. And I think the, the big picture is it's information gathering. Okay, they're, they're gathering information. It's not an assertive sort of thing. Um, you look at where puppies come from and they lick the adults, you know, to, to gain attention, to gain meals. It's, you know, that sort of, you know. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's a friendly... It's often a friendly sort of thing. It can, they, they do lip lick and, and nose lick if they're under pressure as a, as a calming thing. Um, but I mean, the two collies that were, that ended up playing together, the one that wanted the play was licking the quiet one, the calm one. And so I think it's a, it's a you know, it's a friendly way to approach. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. We got time for one more? One more? One more. One more. I get asked a few times by people when they should neuter their dogs. And I get some people say, oh right, yeah, let's neuter the dog at eight months old, or some people neuter their dog at twelve months old. And I often tell them, oh, yeah, if it's a female, let it have at least two goes at it. And it's up to you whether you want to. Two seasons, that's it. Two seasons. Two seasons. Two seasons. And with, with males, I often say, well, it's really your choice. But if you're trying to calm the male, you've only got about a 40% chance of calming the male down by getting them rooted anyway. Yeah. So, what do you think? Um, yeah, de-sexing, does de-sexing influence behaviour? Um, yes, we think it does. Is there a consistent response? No, there's not. Does it always benefit the behaviour? No, it does not. Um, as far as the timing of de-sexing goes, that is a huge thing. Um, 
we, I think, as a veterinary profession, are steering away from blanket recommendations, you know, you dissect your dog at six months or whatever, and working it into the breed and the family that the dog is in and taking into consideration some behavioural things that may improve with it as well. Um, as trainers, I think um, you guys, you know, you know about it and um, you can discuss your experiences with it and have your own recommendations and things. Ultimately, if you are concerned that the dog might need neutering to um, change its behaviour or improve something medically, that's probably a good time to refer into a vet for that particular chat. Um, it's, that's a huge topic and yeah, what age do I spay my dog? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, do I think spaying's good? Yes. Would I spay everybody? No. Um, and the same with castration. Um, that's a really hard, hard one to answer. There's no blanket recommendations, but certainly I think bringing your experience into the class is useful, but being aware that um, the information that we have is changing all the time. And so the recommendations when I graduated 15 years ago, we've changed in 15 years and I expect in another five or 10 years we'll be changing again, um, bringing on board all of the things that are, are popping up. So I haven't really answered your question. <laughs> I don't know if there is an easy answer. Yeah. They will be dogs whether or not they have testosterone. And certainly we know that with girl dogs, they still turn out to be dogs. Um, and early age to sexing is something Shelter's have been doing for a long time. And I think they, they still will grow up. Um, they may not get some of those secondary sex characteristics that the entire ones will have. But I like to think that they're no lesser dog if they've been dissexed at you know, eight weeks than if they were dissexed at 18 months. So they're still definitely doggy enough for me. Yeah. Between the male and the female, the male, generally the bottom uh, suggestion that uh, growth plates are affected by early age sexual and large breed dogs, the males. Is there anything like that with females the same way? Little bits and pieces, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. There's some work that has said yes that dissexing can make it worse. Um, it's an area that needs a lot more, a lot more work in. But yeah. Is it like a smell thing that they lose a smell or something that they know? That they I don't know. <laughs> Dogs are compl complex creatures. <laughs> complex creatures. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, really the last one this time. Okay. Yes, you'd look for um, the, the um, Australian New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists. Yep. If I go back to the first page, has that got that written? That one, the M A N Z C B S one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists. 
they should have a list of um, the veterinarians that have passed their membership examinations and fellowship examinations. The fellowship people are the specialists. Yeah. Emma's member. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the, the college should have a list of um, practicing vets. Some of them I know do consultations through Skype and things as well. Um, but we've got to be careful crossing state boundaries and things. So it would be very specific to where you are. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Must be it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Franklin. <laughs> Thank you very much.